Thanks very much, Patrick and Wayne, and uh, the rest of you for finding time to break away from the hockey to come and uh, listen about developments in biodiversity science and the transformation that a few of us are involved in. I think one of the things we should be proud of in this room is it began in Canada, has been funded heavily by Canada, and it's going to change the way we look at the world of biodiversity. Behind me, uh, you see images and they, uh, of three organisms, and uh, they really bring the point that Patrick made. I mean, morphology of life is uh, immensely seductive. These organisms are beautiful, and humanity has wondered at life and has tried to organize life by looking at it. And of course, we realized with tiny life that we couldn't do that. But with larger life, we felt for a long time that we could do it, and that's wrong. Uh, biodiversity science has failed to deliver an understanding of life on the planet, or its distribution, or its diversity. And I think uh, those of us that have been involved in this enterprise within Canada, increasingly around the world, realize uh, that we need a transformation in technology. And under those organisms, you can keep, see a couple of short strings that have four colors in them. And those four colors, of course, represent the nucleotides in DNA. And we're building an identification system for life on this planet based on the inspection of tiny pieces of DNA. And that's what my talk is going to focus uh, on. A bit of a status report first of where we stand in biodiversity science, what the challenges are, and then a look forward uh, into a, a large project that Canada is actually leading uh, as an international partnership. So this is surely one of the big questions in biodiversity science. How many species are there on our planet? I don't really like what this mic is doing. Variable. How many species are there on our planet? That little colored square in the left-hand corner represents the species that have gained description over the last 250 years, approximately 1.7 million species. The blue square is the best estimate of the number of multicellular species on our planet, somewhere between 5 and 10 million. But we don't know to the nearest order of magnitude. It may well be the entire screen there could well be 100 million species of multicellular life on our planet. And we heard today about viral diversity and protist diversity and bacterial diversity. And we know absolutely nothing about the diversity of these great domains of life. So how many species on our planet 250 years after Linnaeus began this exercise, we do not understand. This is what we do understand. This is the current breakdown of life. We know that arthropods are immensely diverse. We've got a sense of plant diversity, but most of the other groups of life uh, are really not understood. It seems a bit surprising. 250 odd years, thousands of people have contributed to this where the people just not that right that we're doing this. Why haven't we reached the end? The fact is that biodiversity science has attracted some of the really great minds in science. This is one of them. Charles Darwin spent more of his life studying taxonomy and biodiversity than he did on any other enterprise. He spent eight years of his life in the midst of his career uh, and wrote these two books, Monograph of the Barnacles on Our Planet. He thought there were a few hundred species. We now realize there are more than 1,200 species of barnacles on the planet. Darwin didn't do a very good job. Uh, he did win the gold medal of the Royal Society for his work. It's sort of interesting to look at what he felt about the science of taxonomy, how he felt about describing species. When he began, I think he was quite optimistic. So this is actually four years in when he said species Describing species much more difficult than I had expected. And then his pet group, the sessile cirripedes, will ever provide insuperable difficulties in the identification by external characters. 1853. So he's now been at this business for eight years of his life. He started in 1845. After describing a set of forms as distinct species, making them one species, making them separate, and then making them one again, I've gnashed my teeth her species and asked what I committed to be so punished. And anyone that's done taxonomy uh, has that same feeling, I think. And then the catharsis, 
I've been sending 10,000 barnacles out from the house all over the world. I've begun to look at my old notes on species. And of course, that led to the origin of species a few years later. So solving the problem of the origin of species was a tiny one in comparison with describing a few hundred species of barnacles. That's Darwin's story. The first issue then is what species? Aside from how many species there are, when you encounter individuals, it's assigning them to a species, and this is the fundamental disconnect. We now know that there's somewhere between 10 and 100 million species on our planet, and anyone's head. If you devote your life to taxonomy, you may get to the point that you can distinguish about 1,000 of those species, and that's it. So if you go to the rainforest in Costa Rica, this is a picture of a forest in Costa Rica, and you walk into that forest 250 years after humanity began studying plant species and say, what plants are those? The answer will be, we don't know. No one on the planet can identify those plants because they're largely immature. It's a regrowing forest. You'll wait 100 or 150 years for those trees to flower, and then you may be able to identify some percentage of them if you have the right botanist with you and you wait for several years. That's a problem biodiversity science confronts. It's not simply we haven't finished the, the inventory of life. Even those species that have been registered, we can only recognize at certain points in their life. This is me when I began my biological career. Why my parents put that hat on me, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, but uh, Gathering, uh, gathering is one species in this particular case, and I haven't given up collecting. This is in my backyard at Guelph, and I have a malaise trap that runs, and every week I take a bottle off that malaise trap, and there are thousands of specimens in it. Uh, people around the world do this. Uh, at the end of one year, you'll have a collection of jars like this. In Sweden, there are malaise traps deployed over the whole country at this point in time. No one has ever managed to analyze the specimen in a single, all of the specimens in a single malaise trap anywhere on our planet. So if the goal of biodiversity science is to map the distribution of species, we simply can't do it. Why do we find ourselves in this fix 250 years after the job began? I think it's instructive to look back in time look back to the midst of the 19th century at th three of the heroes of science at that point in time, Charles Darwin, John Herschel, and Michael Faraday. Here's where Darwin carried out his work, his study at Downhouse. And you can see the equipment that he used. He bought a microscope. That's the microscope he used to study the barnacles. It cost him 30 pounds. He didn't make it himself. He bought it. If you go to the Smithsonian Institution this year, you'll see a very large portrait of Ed Wilson. He's one of the heroes of biodiversity science. And you'll see Ed Wilson, uh, his organisms that fascinate him beside him, ants, in his hand a magnifying glass and a microscope. 160 years have passed, and the technology may have gone back. Darwin wasn't using a magnifying glass to study barnacles. This is John Herschel's telescope. He became astronomer royal and won numerous awards for the work that he did in South Africa. He was the first guy to take a telescope to the southern hemisphere, set it up, and stare out into space, and looked at the constellations for the first time that were visible in the southern hemisphere. Darwin actually visited him when he was cruising the South Pacific. Herschel built that telescope. 1850, and today, if you look around our planet on the mountain tops, the isolated areas of our planet where there isn't much sound pollution, you'll see huge installations like this. $500 million, $2 billion, immense investments by humanity to study objects that we'll never touch. It'll be shining light down on our planet for billions of years. There's no urgency to do this, but the astronomy community has convinced humans, humanity, that it's worth investing large amounts of money, and we all love the images we see. 
but it could wait. Senses of matter in 1850. This wasn't Michael Faraday's wine cellar. This is how you studied matter in 1850. And today, if you go to CERN, the largest synchrotron on our planet, you'll see an investment of $10 billion. They have to turn out the lights in Switzerland so that they can run this thing. It can only be operated at certain times of the year because the demand on the electrical grid is so great. Looking at particles so small we will ever, never see them. And humanity has the appetite to invest billions and billions of dollars. There are 43 synchrotrons on our planet. CERN happens to be the most expensive. Canada has the Canadian light source. It seems no nation felt it feels it's come of age if it hasn't invested hundreds of millions of dollars in a synchrotron. Biodiversity science, technology stalled, investments minute in comparison with these other disciplines, and yet we come in contact with these organisms every day of the year. They influence our economic well-being, our health, our food production systems. It's an odd disconnect. I think in part the disconnect uh, is deserved. I don't think our science has embraced technology with the vigor that it should have. And perhaps for a few years, we didn't know how we could go about this. But it's quite clear today that we can progress biodiversity science in the most remarkable way by moving away from analog systems to digital systems. And if we look a few years down the line, I think this is the, what the biodiversity labs are going to look like. Here at the Beattie Museum, perhaps in a few years, this is the way biodiversity science will be carried out. It'll be carried out in places around our planet in labs that look very high tech in comparison with our history. So let me talk about where uh, the approach that we're using and how we're going to get to that end point. And this wonderful image, when I look at it, it reminds me of the kind of images that we get when we stare out into space. It's every bit as beautiful, but of course this is a single cell. It's an animal cell, it's got a nucleus, those green objects are the mitochondria. Both those objects have DNA in them and then the cell cytoskeleton. And the question that we confront, that cell, a human cell, has seven billion base pairs in its nucleus it has 16,000 different base pairs in its mitochondrial genome. Surveying all that DNA is very expensive. The question is, as we look at, the, at measuring the diversity of life on our planet, is how little of it can we look at and get an answer in relation to what species have we just encountered? What tree? What bird? What insect? How much of that DNA do we need to look at? And that's what DNA barcoding is about. It's about looking for the minimalist solution, the cheapest possible solution to deliver an inventory of life on our planet. Not the most complex solution. It's not the end point. It's not the ceiling. It's the floor. How little DNA? So a short piece of DNA, ideally just one read, a standard piece of DNA. We need standardization. Humanity resists it every chance it gets. Enabling species discrimination in a large block of life. Wouldn't it be fantastic if you could walk down to the seashore here in Vancouver and read a tiny piece of DNA and it would tell you the identity of every organism in this slide? Wouldn't it be even more fantastic if you could do that anywhere on the planet with any group of life? It's not going to be that simple. It's not going to be a tiny single piece of DNA, but a few years ago, if I were asked how many pieces of DNA would it be, it would be more than we're finding is going to be required. We're finding that a single standard piece of DNA will allow you to recognize virtually every animal species on the planet. And that piece of DNA doesn't come from that big hunk of DNA in the nucleus. It comes from this little circular loop, the 16,000 base pairs of DNA in the mitochondria and that's in every cell of aerobic life. And there are 13 protein coding genes 
in the mitochondrion, but we look at just the front end of one of those genes. Cytochrome oxidase 1, CO1, it's present uh, in nearly every organism, multicellular organism, unicellular organisms, even aerobic bacteria carry this gene. We've been focusing our attention so far in uh, the multicellular life forms. It's moving down into protists, and we had some early discussions today on even viral particles and how it might be possible to extend this concept into microbial life in all of its diversity. Uh, I'm going to focus tonight on just the eukaryote, the multicellular organism part of the story. But the principles of standardization, minimization can surely be applied to life at large. That's the region we use for animals, and it's what I'll be talking about. The same region is useful in some fungi, in some seaweeds, in some unicellular protists. So it's not just a barcode region for animals. Plants. It took a little bit of time to solve the quest of what could we use as the barcode region for plants. It's not going to be the same region as we use for animals. It turns out that mitochondrial DNA evolves slowly in plants, and there was quite an extended quest. Several years, people in this room played an influential role in deciding those genes. And there are two plastid genes that are being used to tell apart the plant species on our planet. So think back to that rainforest in Costa Rica. <clears throat> Anyone can now walk into that forest and identify those plants to a species level. You can take a sapling or a root from that forest and now identify it because of this move. Canada was the first place on the planet to uh, invest in the development of a facility with the capacity to begin a pretty serious effort at assembling barcodes. And I think our nation's undergone quite a remarkable transformation as a consequence of the Canadian Foundation for innovation. We're able not simply to dream about doing big science, but we can actually lead big science projects. And this is one of those projects that began in Canada and is being led out of Canada. This facility opened in 2006. The analytical task in this uh, building is pretty straightforward and simple. One simply takes specimens, whatever specimen you're interested in. It could be a fish, it could be a butterfly, it could be a plant leaf. Take a tiny piece of tissue off it, and then take the tools of big genomics. Take liquid handling devices, take a PCR farm, if you're interested in doing this thousands of times, and uh, the standard uh, first generation sequence, automated sequencing machines that were used for the Human Genome Project and other big genome projects until just a couple of years ago. This pathway will give you a sequence record. So that's just DNA sequencing. In the genomics community, typically the organism that donated that sequence would be thrown away. There was no recognition of the importance of retaining those organisms. But DNA barcoding uses this workflow, but it also respects the traditions of taxonomy. A photograph is taken of the specimen, records on where it's collected are assembled, and that information on the organism is bound together with the DNA sequence information. So that's the workflow of DNA barcoding. Uh, to carry out that whole process, the sequencing process, can be completed now in as little as two hours and could cost as little as 30 or 40 cents. And at the end of it, this is what you get. You get a fly that's missing one leg, so there are lots of five-legged organisms, uh, insects showing up in uh, collections around the world. And that's a DNA barcode, this string of four different nucleotides. It's a word that I think is even harder to pronounce than Welsh town names. Um, and we do this lots of times each year in our core facility. And this is what's... Uh, We'll, we'll analyze about 400,000 specimens this year, and we're aiming to push it up to about a half a million. The process is scalable. Uh, you just buy more machines and get a few more liquid handling robots and a few more people collecting life, and you can process millions and millions of specimens. And we're in the midst now of building this reference library of sequences that needed to drive identifications in the future. 
We need somewhere to store this data. So Canada has led the creation of a database system called the Barcode of Life Data System that stores all those images, stores all those sequence records, and you can see that it's sitting, well, actually, if you look today, it would be over 1.2 million specimens have been analyzed, and Canada has analyzed more than a million of the sequences. So we've done the heavy lifting for the planet, have analyzed about 80% of all specimens, and there is an identification engine here. If you happen to have a sequencer in your kitchen, and you gather one of these sequences, you can drop it into a bowl, this barcode of life data system, and it will tell you the name of the specimen you've encountered, or it'll tell you it's a new species. So, my particular fixation, when I think of our planet, I don't think of it as the blue planet. I think of it uh, as a planet that looks, I'm particularly fascinated by Lepidoptera. They're the second most diverse group of insects on our planet. Uh, we've now barcoded more than 500,000 specimens and 51,000 odd species, and that represents about a third of all the known species in this group on our planet. So the question is, in this immensely diverse group of insects, how well do things work? We've done this work in a whole bunch of different places on the planet, and I'm just going to talk very briefly about Costa Rica, and why do I talk about it? Because it's got a very diverse assemblage of species, at least 10,000 species. It was believed 10,000 as a consequence of barcoding, the number is rising, and it will be 15,000 or so. I will show you one figure of barcode data and one only really, just to give you a sense of the patterns that we see. So this is one uh, group of uh, large moths, the silk moths, <clears throat> and what uh, this number is within the species, 0 0.46, half a percent. The barcode region is 650 base pairs long. A half a percent of 650 means two or three substitutions on average among members of a species. On the other hand, between very closely related species, it's 6%. Six percent. Six times 650 is about 40 differences. So within a species, there's tiny amounts of variation. This isn't like a store barcode where every tin of tuna has exactly the same number on it, every tin of, uh, but they're very close. So here you can see uh, individuals, two individuals of a particular species, the straight line, that signals no variation between those two individuals. The small uh, gap you see there, that's a tiny amount of variation among individuals of species and so on. But you note these long branches here. That's the difference between closely related species. So in this particular small data set on these very large moths that have been intensely studied by taxonomists, every species previously recognized could be discriminated. And in fact, when the work was carried out, a number of overlooked species were detected. So that's a tiny data set in Costa Rica. Hyperdiverse tropical assemblage, this simple approach tells apart all the species recognized in the last 250 years. And this is another group of uh, Lepidoptera from the Costa Rica, the Hesperids, the skippers, and there are about 500 species of skippers. And I just, you can see these long branches and see the small amount of variation, even when there's quite large numbers of individuals in a species, deep branches between, and I won't punish you by forcing you to look at the entire 10,000 species tree uh, from Costa Rica, but I think you get a, the neat thing is, I could show you a tree that was 150,000 species long, and they would all look like this. The species, the members of different species on the end of long branches, members of a species glued together. So, tropical biodiversity, Lepidoptera, the approach works. But it's not just in Lepidoptera. The pilot studies have been done on mammals, on reptiles, on ants, on fishes, on birds, on all of the major groups of animal life have been studied with the similar results. This tiny piece of DNA tells organisms apart. So 
these data collected over the period from about 2003 to 2007. Because early on there were some questions about the efficacy of the approach. People said it can't be so simple that a standard piece of DNA will tell species apart. By 2007, we had done enough proof of principle to cause us to think about launching a large project. The International Barcode of Life Project, we assembled people at the University of Guelph in June of 2007. And then began one of the more interesting challenges that I've been involved in and others have, and that's trying to build a very large, by biodiversity standards, uh, community around the world, raising the money, motivating people to become involved. And the goal of this project was pretty simple. We asked people to imagine a world in which you could know the name of effectively any organism that you encountered on the spot in a matter of minutes using DNA sequencing technology. Uh, we set a, a goal. We said within five years we would like to gather barcode records for 500,000 species and 5 million individuals. And of course that's a tiny fraction of all the multicellular life on the planet, but the feeling was this was a very important first step to, to the rush to the finish, to build this reference library of sequences for every multicellular organism on the planet. But biodiversity scientists have been used to working with very tiny amounts of money, have been used to working as individuals as opposed to in a large collectivity. So the first thing we began with was the challenge to organize the community. And fortunately within Canada, we had a national research network that provided us with a, a springboard uh, in terms of organization and models. And so this is the model that we proposed is that certain nations would do the heavy lifting. They'd be called central nodes and they'd commit at least $25 million. And we'd have national nodes that were at the opposite end that would contribute a million dollars to the project. And finally in the midst, we'd have the, the, the nations in, in blue the regional nodes that would contribute $5 million and we would push this project forward as a grand international collaboration. We met later that year in Taiwan. Uh, we walked out of the meeting in Guelph with the feeling that it was absolutely possible to do this. We met again later that year in Taiwan and this is the community of people that were there. That was the global assembly. But again, the feeling was everyone felt Yes, we could do it, but of course uh, we didn't have the money at that point, and so it led to the next two years. So this was June 2007 when we began. It took three years to raise the commitments and build the international alliance to get us to the next level. So these are the kinds of meetings that were happening. This is one in, in Beijing. Uh, this is a meeting in Argentina, a meeting in Europe. So these meetings continued a series of meetings ramping up support for the plan. And today if we uh, look at the colored world that had no uh, funding commitments in 2007, I won't say that we have all $150 million in place because that was the scheduled budget for the project. But I will say that there have been very significant commitments and we're now close enough to reaching the final goal that we proceeded with uh, a launch for the project. So if you were in Toronto uh, in September of this year, uh, that's when the official science launch occurred. And we managed to paint the CN Tower with the DNA barcode of a Canadian beaver. And um, a month later in Nagoya, Japan, the project became a formal part of the Convention on Biological Diversity's uh, portfolio of large projects. So the project launched. <clears throat> Second challenge is gathering the millions of specimens that are going to be required to carry out the project. And many people have already begun engaging in this. So you can see here the Binatang Research Center in Papua New Guinea. So we're working in many places in field stations around the world. There's more than a thousand scientists involved in this project now. Uh, that other station sitting on the mountainside there is in French Guiana and uh, there's an effort to barcode all species. So there's some static stations like this that are gathering specimens. There are also mobile efforts. Uh, the one, Discover Life Through DNA, um, that Discover Nature Through DNA, that's actually 
a vehicle that we have at our institute that just will be leaving on Monday for the southern U.S. and it will spend four months down there and then it will move north. And uh, so it spends about six months a year roaming and collecting specimens for analysis. A Toyota, uh, that red truck, is one of 10 trucks that are being sponsored by Toyota in South Africa uh, for the next three years on barcode collecting safaris. <clears throat> you may say, why are we bothering to collect specimens when the world's museums are stacked with them? And of course, we want to make good use of the collections. These are the muse this uh, is a museum, the Institute of Zoology in Beijing. Immense stores of, of specimens in our museum, several billion specimens. The difficulty is the DNA in, in almost all these specimens is degraded to a more or less a serious extent, but we're coming better and better at analyzing them. These are some wonderful bird collections at the Smithsonian and insect collections at the California Academy of Sciences. The interesting thing is um, the curators of some of these museums view their role mainly as archivists. They hate having you take a book down off the shelf, i.e. they hate having you touch their bug, and if you ask for a leg off it, oh my God, what are you doing? So we've had real difficulty gaining access to the specimens to build this reference library. Australia was the first place where the leaders of the national collection said, please, come into our collection. You may sample every specimen that you're interested in within the collection. Start at A and work to Z. We're happy to have you do this. So we went there last October, uh, and I went with a team of five people, and in the course of that brief period, we sampled 13,000 specimens and more than 4,000 species. That's 40% of all the species ever collected in this group in Australia over the last 250 years. And the results of those specimens, they were analyzed within the next two months, and barcode records are now available on the web. And Australia got so excited about this, they just had us go back to do another 5,000 species, and they're now laying plans for a massive project that's going to see the barcoding of specimens in every collection in their nation within the next few years. They'll, in fact, be trying to raise $50 million within Australia, and the people in leadership positions within the government believe that funding will be in place. So it's possible to make very effective use of the historic collections that have been assembled in our grand museums and in collections such as this that is here at the Beattie Museum. I mean, this is now adding value to all those specimens. I'm absolutely convinced we're going to have no trouble getting the 5 million specimens and the 500,000 species, the raw material. But the next issue is, are we going to be able to sequence them? And at the moment, uh, as I mentioned, 80% of the sequencing has been done in Canada. And in fact, we plan to play quite a significant role in this project. We will analyze at least 2 million, more likely 2.5 million, of the specimens that are being assembled for this project. But we're going to need help. We can't raise enough money in Canada to pay for the sequencing reagents. We could scale and do any number of specimens, but simply raising the money uh, within this country, we think we've, Canada's made a grand contribution to this project. It's put about $80 million into building facilities and supporting the science. So that's very significant. So we're looking at the central nodes in the Eyeball project. Uh, we're looking uh, to Beijing. It's setting up a major facility in China to do sequencing. We're looking at the Smithsonian in Washington. And then we're looking at smaller facilities that are bubbling up around the world to contribute to this project. So that's back to our little facility. And we're actually just building now a, a fourfold larger extension on it with the help of, again, funding from CFI. So Canada will, do, uh, will host the secretariat for this project, its informatics hub, and its largest sequencing facility. So this is what you get, that little building that you saw on the other side, and this one, 50,000 square feet for $30 million in Canada. Go to China. This is the Kunming Institute of Biodiversity. 500,000 square feet of space for the same amount of money. 
China is developing, and this is going to be the, the core facility for sequencing within China. And while I love buildings like this, the other thing I really love are the things, that the grassroot efforts that's starting. So the top uh, image shows a facility that just opened in Chetumal, Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula. And it was built for $80,000. And they managed to raise the money to equip it. And they're now doing all stages of barcode analysis except sequence analysis. The final sequencing gets done in our facility, but all of the other stages are done there. And in India and in other nations, we're seeing these small grassroots artisanal facilities contributing to this large project. We're going to have the sequencing capacity, I'm quite certain of that. We're going to generate millions of records. This is a global resource. Humanity is going to make use of this for a long time, and we need somewhere to protect those data. And as I mentioned, Canada started creating the barcode library, and in fact, we now have money to keep it alive at least until 2016. But any system that only lives in one place is fragile. And it's expensive. We've invested about two and a half million dollars in computer hardware. We have about 17 people that work on the project to incorporate the data that's flooding in each week, each day. 8,000 sequences came in a couple of days ago from China. Fortunately, other nations are seeing the value of this data system, and there's an effort to create mirror sites at various places around the planet. The Institute of Microbiology in Beijing will host the China Node. The Atlas of Living Australia in Canberra will look after, will be a mirror site. Uh, the uh, Central Bureau for Chemoculture, the Fungal Center in Utrecht, and finally, in uh, perhaps not surprisingly, in Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil, immense biodiversity in that nation there. They're moving forward with plans of the mirror site. So I'm, again, I'm confident we're going to be able to manage the data. The biodiversity science community, as I indicated early on, has failed in its quest to effectively inventory biodiversity on our planet. We don't know the number of species. We don't know their distribution. When we visited Anik, we found hundreds of species sitting in the Lepidoptera collection that have been there for more than half a century, undescribed. The Biodiversity Science Committee tends to closet things away, and that's not the way to progress science. Our project, iBull, is deeply committed to rapid data release. We're moving the sequence records onto the web within three months of data collection, on average six weeks after data collection. And the effect of this, you can see here in 2007, each of those uh, yellow dots indicate sites where there's coverage, red dots indicate deeper coverage, more than 100 records. 2009, 2011, of course the goal is to turn the world red. Deep coverage at every point on our planet. We're breaking one of the fundamental barriers, and this was requiring a culture change in the biodiversity science community, but quite honestly, we're seeing more and more members of our community welcome this change. We're committed to progressing technology. This is a little handheld device that we all wish we had. Wouldn't it be great if you could go for a walk in the woods with your kid? You see a plant. You see a frog. You touch it. You put the little piece of paper that you touched on the frog in that slot. The DNA is extracted. The barcode region is PCR amplified. The sequence is matched with the reference library. And if that sequence matches, Maybe you were in the Caribbean and you had a blue starfish in your hand and it identifies it as Linkia lavagata and shows you that picture. Yeah, that's what I've got in my hand. And then it says, but your GPS says you're in the Caribbean and this is a Pacific species only. It's an invader. You need to notify someone and if you do, you'll get 500 free identification credits. Or 
this is a new species. Would you like to name it after your daughter, your son? What is their name? Please type it here. We will describe it automatically. It's the only way we're going to progress biodiversity science, automated identifications, automated species descriptions. We need to shake this field up. And one way to do it is empowering humanity. And I actually think it will have a very powerful effect on conservation when people feel the deeper connectedness to life around them. It is fun to think about identifying single individuals. But think about the other task that we're confronted with, and that's mapping life on our planet. Think back to that malaise trap in my backyard, the 2,000 or 3,000 specimens each week. Go to the tropics, it's 30,000. Do we really want to pull a leg off each one of those specimens? Have we got the time to do that? I don't think so. We have to think about this other approach where we deal with bulk samples, where we take a kilogram of insects in that particular pile of Lepidoptera there, whip them up, make a bug shake, extract the DNA, read the DNA extract, and what species were in the mix. And I think this is the way that we're going to be surveilling our planet. We're going to be able to read life the organisms in a cubic meter of seawater. We're going to be able to study the organisms that are present in our national parks, the organisms that are potentially invading in the ports around our world. We have to make it as easy to read biodiversity as it is to read a thermometer. We haven't even calibrated the thermometer yet for biodiversity science. Of course, for society to um, change from its current trajectory of underfunding biodiversity science, we have to make sure that our work is relevant and that humanity is engaged. And we're already seeing the appetite for this information. There are many areas of society where species identifications are required. The seafood marketplace, the public health issues, Identifying the organisms that ricochet off aircraft, forensic identifications, education. This was a great little project done by high school kids in New York City that's already made it into secondary school textbooks. And these girls went out and sampled sushi in restaurants in New York City and found that about 25% of the sushi was not what it was supposed to be. And guess what? It was always cheaper things being substituted for expensive things. And because of work like this, the FDA, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, have now decided that barcoding is an important part of their business plan. We need to use the tools that are going to be presented through next generation sequencing, this capacity to gather sequence information cheaply, to look at issues uh, where there's mixtures, for example, in herbal medicines. The big analyses that I talked about, the food web analyses, larval recruitment of fishes in our oceans, pest monitoring programs, oil sands, huge economic contr contribution to our society, but with potential downside impacts on the environment. We need to be able to survey those things and mitigate the impacts. And that project is actually going on at this point with support from Genome Canada. So it's gaining use. We're going to be monitoring water quality around Canada using these approaches. Society is going to be supportive because it's going to see the practical application. If you go to the Googleplex in Mountain View, you'll see barcode exhibit on the wall there. People are starting to recognize that this is going to transform, and people like Google that are interested in making all the information on our planet easily accessible see the value of this digital transformation the move from analog to digital signals in biodiversity science. My last slide.
began with the big questions of biodiversity science. How many species on their planet? We don't know. We soon will. What species? In the rainforest, in the malaise trap, in any other setting. We'll soon be able to map the distributions through automated analysis. The hardware that I showed you will be a reality in just a few years in many places around our planet. We're really developing a global bioidentification system. Biology's answer to global positioning systems. Just think of the impact that GPS had on all our ability to find our location on the planet. This little digital device that reads life is going to be exact analog to that. We're tapping into the digital stream that underpins all life on our planet. I'm an evolutionary biologist, and we're starting to get tantalizing glimpses of big patterns in evolutionary biology. How old are the species on our planet? What impact of various ecological or life history traits, what do they have on the lifespan of species? Conserving life. We live on a planet where most people in my business think that sometime in this century, one third of the species on our planet will be gone. These species we now know have persisted for millions of years. On average, about four million years. When you see a butterfly fly by you, that species has been here four million years, on average. 65 million years ago, there was a massive meteorite impact that took out 25% of our life, life on this planet. Humanity is poised to do exactly the same thing. And the only way to mitigate that is to do a better job of setting up preserves, a better job of monitoring life on our planet. You can't conserve it if you can't recognize it and you can't map its distribution. And then finally, the appetite that humanity will have for this, I suspect, may not be driven by the lofty concerns of learning more about evolution or conserving life, but instead of the practical importance. If we stop a single invasive species, my lab was the first uh, one to encounter the zebra mussel in the Great Lakes, it was introduced in the ballast of a ship. It's cost Canada more than $500 million. If we had had intelligent biological surveillance programs that had stopped the zebra mussel, it would have more than paid for the global inventory of life. It's very easy to make a case for the transformation of biodiversity science based simply on cost-benefit analysis. We need to analyze in this. Uh, there are a bunch of wonderful biologists in Canada <clears throat> who are committed and many of them right here in Vancouver committed to trying to make this vision a reality. I've been joined by people around the world, and I'm quite proud to live in a country that's uh, given birth to this enterprise, made it possible for us to do it, um, not without some challenges, but uh, we're pretty optimistic, and that's what the next two days, yesterday and today, have been focused on, is looking at how we might uh, progress this task. So thank you very much.